Yeah. Ah, welcome everybody to Ohm School Live. We're smack dab in the middle of summer, so we were having a little summer chat there. Hello, Lisa. <laughs> Ah, well, Master Spiritual Teacher, G.P. Walsh, and myself, student and host, Lisa Berry, have an impromptu fun. You know what? We were, there were so many lessons that were being called upon and called forward that, ah, there were so many, we couldn't land on one exactly, but we do have an overlapping theme. And my opening to this, good morning, Ava, it, or afternoon, uh, is, oh, right. it is, it is no, I think it's even evening for them. It's evening now. I was going to say, actually, yeah, you're going into supper time. <laughs> so yeah. we're going to have like a little fun, like as if we're in summer school, you know, when you can be a little bad, but not. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll open it up for maybe a little bit more. But I have to share that this last week, if not two, the word change has come up. And that's funny because we're having a change of schedule. But how many of you put in the comments, please, do you remember mood rings? those mood rings you know and it was so exciting you know you'd look at them and when you're when you're little and everybody you know loves you and you're super safe you are so excited to go look what mood i'm in look what mood i'm in and you sh and here you change it and you you exchange these rings and you see how everybody changes and then when you get older you think oh i don't want no anybody to know my mood i'm not putting that ring on <laughs> it's gonna give me away <laughs> so i i thought of this mood ring as i was you know, choosing my my jewelry for today. And um, and then I thought of something even more very natural, temperature rings. Yes, thank you. It was your temperature. Perfect thing to bring mm -hmm. up, Sierra, because what also reminded me was I had a pet carpet chameleon, a little cute little, little lizard, teeny tiny little sweetie pie. And he was usually green, but when he was unhappy or scared, like when he was in fear, he would turn black. And it it had an impression on me. I immediately felt that color change. Like, Ooh, he's black. Like I thought at first he was angry and evil. And then I looked it up and went, Oh, he's there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and he's he, possessed. He was, I really, he looked very, you know, creepy. And then they have their black. And, and what also he turned black was I used to, now I don't anymore. And because of him, I would wear perfume. And so when I used to put him on my shoulder, it was a toxin to him. It was dangerous to him and he would turn black. And learning this about him, I stopped wearing hairspray and perfume. And, um, and we change, we change because our environment gives us signals that it, it's either safe or not safe. And GP and I are here always. This is what we do. We love to end suffering, to be happy. And, and how would, do we do that? We become safe. But there are so many levels of that safety. And GP, my big starter question about change is, do we really ever change? And I don't want to say permanently, but do we change always for just safety? And is that for the better? Or are we changing for safety? And it could be for the worse? Well, the the change is inevitable. Change happens. There's okay. nothing you can do about it. Without change, life doesn't happen. We can't function without change. I mean, everything the body is doing is nothing but change. It's just processing food. That's all that's doing <laughs> all day long because everything within this, this, this thing here that we call the body, it has to constantly replenish itself. Nothing's static in it. Nothing just sits there, right? It, it has to replenish itself. All living organisms do. So change is inevitable. Um, the, the nature of the nervous system is to want to keep, you might call it pattern integrity. It wants to keep the body together. We call that survival. But it's a very, it's a very primitive and very, very low level need to just keep this particular form functioning as long as it can. Right? And it's just kind of built into the into the whole system all the way up and down the line, right? And so the most successful species are those that can adapt to a changing environment. If you're perfectly adapted to an environment, it all is well, right? Yeah. You know, you're top of the food chain, nothing's bugging you. What happens if the environment changes, which it inevitably will, right? When that does, our capacity to change with it will determine whether or not we survive. And, uh, but we have to recognize because this, this, this drive force, the stability, which is what safety is all about. 
right? The drive to stability where things aren't changing is so strong that in humans, it's taken, a, it's taken an odd turn because for the first time ever, as humans, we can actually influence the environment. So where every animal, believe me, every animal, if they could stop the environment from changing, would. Yeah. <laughs> but they can't. They're just responding to it. That's all they can do. And if their particular their, their particular body type is able to adapt to the new environment um, it, and be successful, it'll survive. And you know things like frogs and toads and some aquatic other aquatic reptiles, they can literally live in every environment on the planet. Amazing! <laughs> it is amazing. I mean, it, from the desert to the Arctic. <laughs> from the pH level of the yeah. water too. <laughs> you know? Yes. Yes, but of course, that's also why they're an indicator species, right? Oh. Um, within the environment, you know, when an environment is degrading, it, it the the effect that you see of the, the degradation is not usually visible to humans right away. It's beginning to become now, you know, with wildfires and floods and all that kind of stuff. But the indicators are there long before that. And one of the, there's, uh, there's um, there are different kinds of plants and animals that occupy that space where they're most sensitive to the changes in the environment. So when they begin to change, you know, the environment is degrading. Wow. Um, and they, those indicators have been going off for decades. <laughs> but not not to, not to change not to change the the, the subject we're talking we about I mean I'm look, trying to look at I'm trying to show it safety is on the most primitive level right and we've got conceptual ideas about it and the like but the thing that's driving it is is the reality of change the reality that our is conscious beings we want change we can become dissatisfied with the way things are and want things to be different. And at the same time, everything inside us is saying, I want nothing to be different. I will resist change to my grave. <laughs> and so within a, you can see that across the whole so social strata. This is where you get evangelicals and fundamentalists and, and racists because they refused to respond to the reality that's already here. And so they're doing their best to hold on to it. It's going to fail inevitably, right? But in the process, you're going to make a mess. <laughs> that's interesting. I oh now that's a tricky one. Oh, oh it's reminding me of the, your story about you know, and anyway, we almost start, put the hand in the jar, want the banana, the cookie, whatever's in there, but you can't pull it out. But you can't keep like oh yes. the cookie or the tree. Yeah, the, mon the monkey <laughs> so, trap. That's the, the Indian monkey, monkey trap. trap. Yeah. yeah. And what I'm thinking, like to use an, a, a lifestyle example right now, a lot of people can find themselves in a, a job, a career. Maybe they've been there for so long and they're like, I just want to change. You know, I just I'm looking for a change, something different. But yet the very thought of changing isn't safe. So then they don't change, but then they hate where they are. They, they hate where they are but they don't feel safe to move out to somewhere they're not. That could be in a relationship. It could be in a financial situation. It could be in a weight, like certain body weight, but, but we're going a little deeper here. And when, and that is, you know what? That is deep because that's how we live. That and is. it's, it's it. right with everything. It doesn't like, yeah, that's not yeah. perfect. Deep. That's, it's neither <laughs> that's deep nor important. shallow. It's the way <laughs> stuff is. <laughs> yes. And so when we, come across somebody who I think that's why I think it's insulting some that we can take it as an insult. Our ego can, when 20 years later, you run into somebody and they say, you haven't in a good way, you, you haven't changed a bit or yeah, then they, can, or they really? say you haven't changed a bit. Oh, you're, you're coming back in a minute. I know. Hold on. Here. There we go. And sometimes <laughs> you can be in with a, a, a mother, father, child relationship. And they'll say, say to the mother, you haven't changed a bit. You're still the same. And I hate it, you know? And it, right. so that's why I was wondering about change because sometimes we can say, no, in 70 years, some people don't change, but in a day, other people can seem, you know, flighty. Oh yeah. I, I, I you know, it, it was my coming up on a 50th high school 
a reunion, right? A couple of years, two years ago, and now they, they've tried to say, make it, you know, class 70 at 70, right? Oh. And so I still have some, I still have some contact with all the, the, the people. They have me email, they send me stuff. They have, most of them haven't changed. Most of them haven't moved from where they lived. They still live in the same, the same town. And, um, and you can see it reflected in their attitudes and reflected in their ideas and stuff like there's there's others um that you know have gone all over the place like like i did but it, it's 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 real i i i mean there's there's you get used to a certain way of being you know Especially like in the United States in the 50s and 60s, I mean, it was just, it was prosperous, a rare event in the history of countries where there was kind of this universal, this universal prosperity, which is ever since the early 70s has been, has been declining. Um, but that ideal has still been perpetuated. So everybody wants to hold on to something that, that really wasn't real in the first place. It was only really wonderful and prosperous if you were white. <laughs> <laughs> if you weren't white, it wasn't so great, right? So there's this illusion, right, that everybody wants to hold on to because it was an artificial safety. It was a temporary condition that just happened to exist. It wasn't really safe. Oh, two big words there, artificial and temporary. Yeah. So artificial conditions, is that, no, temporary conditions, artificial illusion. So so say we, we're, we're starting to do some self-inquiry work. We're, we're doing the work and we feel, wow, I really feel like I've changed. I really feel like I'm a new person or I have this awareness, which we do. We, we can't do self-inquiry without having something change. Or can we actually? Mm -hmm. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> well, that's not the goal of it. Right. right. That's not the goal of it, but that it's inevitable that it does, right? Because self-inquiry reveals what what you have been believing yourself to be and weren't and therein lies all the problems and that's why i favor the word reconciliation the the process is a reconciling with what is you could also call it if you want to use religious terms it's surrendering to what is right yeah. which is kind of when you think about it it's absurd to think otherwise i'm surrendering to what it's what is i mean what else can i do <laughs> it kind of holds all the cards, right? <laughs> but but this is the but we we create the the illusion. There was this illusion of an American dream, right? And we don't want to let go of the illusion. It, it was never real. It was always illusory. It always it 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 always was just an image presented that got believed, and a little bit of inquiry would have seen right through it. And that's the point of doing self-inquiry. It, it, it is to reconcile our beliefs and our assumptions and our attitudes with what is real. <laughs> okay, I was trying to do a word replacement there. So can I, can I, just for fun, it's to surrender to what our thoughts and attitudes are to what is real. No, we're surrendering the, our, what our beliefs are to that which is actually true. The beliefs we hold on to because they make us feel safe. When we realize they're not actually making you safe, they're just making you feel safe, and in fact are increasing the danger because it's not really safe, then you begin to drop them. <clears throat> you begin to see through and go, oh, this, this isn't helping me. This okay, isn't doing so anything for me at all. I, I'm imagining a, a small child who had been in trauma or danger and pretended that if they put on their invisible cloak, you know, or their, you know, pretend. Or and now if safe. I stay under the cover, if I stay under the blankets, I'm safe. Right. Right. Yeah. So we almost have to surrender, which sounds sad and awful to say you have to reconcile or surrender that you aren't really safe. Well, under it the it blanket. does. Unless you're until you realize that I, you're surrendering what's false for what's true. <laughs> oh. Right. It feels like a surrender because you believed it was true and it was giving you false hope. Yes. So it Do feels like I'm letting, I'm having to let go of something, but it's yeah. not the case. You're, you're letting go of what's of nonsense. <laughs> okay. So, oh, so that, oh, so, okay. So once you, oh, that's the difference. If you surrender something that you 
don't believe, that's not the time to, you can't. So you can't let go of something that you're not ready to let go of. You that cannot let go of something you believe, no. You can't. Right, okay. <laughs> Hence the need for inquiry. You have to come to see that it actually isn't true. And at that point, it's not a surrender at all. It could be a shock, right. <laughs> for sure. But at that, the moment you see it, it's 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 game over. Right. It's not even easy to let go. It's done. It's it gone. It's evaporated. It's, it's gone. The lights it's, have been know, turned on. When you know that two plus two equals four and not three, you don't have to struggle <laughs> with. <laughs> <Don't cry. laughs> but I wanted it to be. <laughs> So we don't have emotional anything emotional investment in 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 that, right? Right. Yes. Right. But you know, there's plenty of people that come up with a theory. It's accepted. Everybody thinks it's wonderful, and somebody comes along and disproves it. You're damn right. They're feeling a little bit uh, protective. Yeah. Edison did it all the time. Tesla upped him every single time, and he just got around him politically, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Is there? A a time okay this is going to be the wrong word but should we ever or is it ever do we mourn that that is no longer true and that a false thing just showed up and you're like ah oh, but I, I i liked that i now i'm sad that it's not true well yeah there's there's you know we it sounds like okay i i got it and everything just kind of falls away remember you've got emotional and physical and psychological investment in these things. And when you see that they're not true, there's a momentum that's still there. So yes, there can be some emotional uh, distress, there can be a sense of disorientation, there there can be a, there can be even grief. It's like, you know, what happened to my little world, right? You know, like a child when they're, you know, when they find out Santa isn't real or something, right? Um, it's kind of like, what? What? I mean, what do you do it that? Yes, it's it doesn't change the fact and it doesn't change that in the moment you see it, you really can't. There's you know, you're past the point of no return. But the impact of it, when we realize how much we have invested in it, how much we've trusted in it, how much we relied on it and thought this was the way it was going to be. And of course, again, this is why you see the reactions and evangelicals and racists and all sorts of groups that are just clinging to something when it's uh, it's self-evidently bogus and destructive even yes <laughs> yes i i must share that when i did hear about santa claus i negotiated my way out of that one um but <laughs> 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 I made a deal with my father that I would only believe him if that we could believe and know that there are people like Santa in the world. And yeah, I yeah. would go along with that. I'm, I'm that perfectly willing to give up that, that belief as long as I keep getting the gifts. <laughs> oh, yeah. That, oh, that's a better one. I should have gone with that one. Right? <laughs> should have gone with that one. <laughs> in saying that, that's interesting that that comes up because uh, the next question was going to be, can we ever revisit? <coughs> If once a, a, a belief, once we've changed, we've changed. The belief has been dropped. I got it. Yep, Santa Claus. Okay, that one's not real. But perhaps there's someone like Santa Claus, and many of them. Like, do we ever revisit just to see if any of it is true still for yourself? Or yeah, yeah none of this is cut and dry. Yeah. Right. Because it's life, you know, and it's and it's a human life. So it's it's not something that's just. You know, a little checklist you can follow: wrong, right, wrong, true, false, right. It's, it, it, because because of this, the the fact that we have so much invested, and the the need for safety is still very real, even though even though the way in which we've been going about it ha has seemed to be bogus, and in fact and counterproductive, that need is still there, yes. and oftentimes when what it was. What it, what, when the truth has been glimpsed, <clears throat> there's a, an instability because, well, where do I stand now? Because that need to know is still there, right? Yes. Right, and, and now it's exacerbated because, because you used to think you knew. <laughs> yes, actually, yeah, I feel more <laughs> in danger when I think of being in that place right now of change. I, okay, I've changed. Great. This is no longer. But I, now I'm feeling this this extreme um, instability. I know you're coming back. Um, and and now I super need safety because 
it, it's all gone. Does and what? Correct. What, yes. When people yes. are left and now, there, it's just raw. Now you're just now it's just raw. Well, now what what do I do? What do you do? What do I do? Yeah, you you you. you this is you continue with the inquiry. Okay, well, where is it then? Right? Does it exist? Right? To what degree does it exist? You know, it becomes this real desire for truth. Right? I mean, that's what started in the first place. At this point, you, I don't want another bogus, uh, uh, cheap substitute that is going to collapse just like this one does. Eventually, we the, the the hunger for for the real deal um, it takes over, and you reach right into the into the midst of it. You reach right into the very thing itself. It's beautifully expressed in the in the story of Moses when he talking to the burning bush um, before God reveals Himself as the I Am, the sense of being. Um, uh, he tells Moses to he. he he demonstrates to him the, the, the absolute frailty of what we thought was real by, by giving you leprosy and then taking it away. But this one was really interesting because um, Moses was a shepherd, right? And he had a shepherd's crook, right? Which is this big, tall stick with a thing, and it's for, you know, bring him. It's, it helps. It's basically the tool by which his whole livelihood, everything works. You know, you find the potholes, you search things out, you, you know, drag the sheep back and things like and, and things like that. And God says to him, throw down the staff. And he throws it down and it becomes a serpent. And he's terrified and he runs away from it. <laughs> right. And God says, come, you little, little coward, come back here, <laughs> pick it up. Right? But it, it's a beautiful image of all the stuff we have relied on during our lives, we've leaned on. They've been our tools of the trade, the means in which we, in, in which we've been living our life, and suddenly we find out it's a, it's a snake. It's a poisonous snake. <laughs> Did he have to pick it up as a snake? Yes. It oh didn't turn God. back into a staff. It didn't turn back into a staff until he picked up the snake. Oh no! That was terrifying. So, <laughs> oh no! <laughs> no that, that's that, that and it, it perfectly illustrates this. It's yes. all taken away, yeah. and now what do I do? I have to reach in right into this mess. It's not just going to reform nice and pretty again, because if it does, then it's just another another step that's going to turn into another snake. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I. You know what? I don't. I don't remember that story. That was really good. <laughs> It's perfect. <laughs> and, and, and so that is where we talk about um, taking action from the heart uh, as opposed to cur. Oh, well, that is a bit courageous, isn't it? It's belief. It's a pure belief that he has to be believing and trusting to pick that snake up, that it's okay, that he's safe. Yes. Well, well, he just simply directed, he didn't feel safe. Obviously he ran right. away. <laughs> right, <laughs> little candy ass, come back here. <laughs> right, he had to be coaxed to go back and pick it up. Right, right. so I mean, it, it was not like he was just like confident and just strutting on in, right? You know? right. He wasn't he wasn't Gaston from Beauty and the Beast? He was he was a what? He was he's in shock, right? Right. His whole life has just proven to be a fraud. <laughs> so do, can, is that what stops people from continuing the self-inquiry work possibly? Or, okay, that's enough change for now. Just, whoa, let me adjust, like get resituated here, gain, gain my stability. And yeah, yes, and they is. start testing it, then, it out. Yeah, when the stuff's, if there's not a proper preparation, which I call the yoga of allowing, when this stuff comes up, um, it's very difficult to sit in the midst of it. It takes, it takes practice. Right. Uh, Muji emphasizes this all the time, just that willingness to stay there as the witness, right? Yeah. And not believe anything, to not take any position at all, right? No matter what the thought is, no matter how true it seems, no matter how false it seems, no matter what it is, do not accept it. Simply watch it. Do not do not mix with it at all. S establish no relationship, either for or against. Yes. 
I, I have to share with everybody here as a student, brand new, well, I feel brand new to GP, two years now, <laughs> there you go. Uh, for the first year, I know for at least a year, if not longer, I stayed as that witness. And I even could tell from my words that were not coming out of my mouth anymore. I was neither for nor against. I was just a witness. I didn't even know what to think anymore because I was just in self-inquiry, 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 witnessing, witnessing, observing, and not owning, and uh, but not it was it was a whole rocky world that first year so if you <laughs> hopefully you would love to have a session with me but, <laughs> but it, it really is an interesting position to take and not take because you're not taking any position but you have you're not taking that. a position and that is what is so uncomfortable because yeah. the and and that is why it is not the ego because the ego can't but help take a position right the ego is nothing but a position no position, no ego. Right. Yes. So when you're in that place of simply witnessing, you are the pure awareness. You are your God self in that moment. You don't know it, but you are. Because that is the disposition of the Most High. Yes. Um, it's interesting to say about it's the egos taking the position. And I... <laughs> I my my father is is very non positiony and I remember so many times people would try to egg him on because their ego really wanted him to take a position, and I always would just watch <laughs> my father. He would just stand there and say, "Well, this is where I am. You can be wherever you are. You can want me to be wherever you want me to be, but this is where I am." <laughs> and I'd be like, "Dad, don't you just want to punch him in the face?" Or so, you know, and he'd be like, yeah. <laughs> "And and I just I that's a it's a." a and he's 72 or one now as you know, so he's, he's had lost, but he's been like that for, so I think you're, you're, that's an interesting point. Whereas even when we, we are in the witnessing period, let's call it that we're a student and we're self inquiring and we're in that thing, others can still, our ego can still be called upon and others be like, what are you doing? What? You don't have an opinion. You're not going to stand up for yourself. You're not going to let that, you know, do, you can get egged on almost. And it's, if you're if if our egos then step into that, then we've been knocked off out of our witness position, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, we've we've relinquished the witness position and re-identified with the false self, with the egoic mind. Um, and and the, I mean the the best thing to notice about that is that you have to be you have to be seduced or coerced into re-identifying with it. It can't take you. You have to take it. And that's why you're always in the power position. Right. The devil can't make you do anything. He's got to convince you that you want to. <laughs> right. But who's the devil in this position? So if, okay, I got to think ego. about this. I have to say yes to the ego. The ego can't make me. I mm -hmm. am being seduced by. By, by the, by what? whatever part of you is still attached to the promises of the egoic mind still thinks there's something to get still thinks there's some advantage in being a person mm. and that takes time to expunge all of it because yeah. you know even on the path to enlightenment we think somehow the ego is going to get enlightened <laughs> it's funny <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was brilliant right there. You're right. I think I actually did think that all this time until just literally now. Because I want, yes, I want to be enlightened. Who's that I? Right. Yeah. Freedom from that I is enlightenment. All right, guys, I need some comments on this one. This is getting deep. <laughs> <laughs> well now i would be going down i'd be sniffing down the wrong trail then if i would just yeah i want this part well, of it everybody I mean, does that you know, everybody does that because that sense of i is so deeply ingrained even when we 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 start to inquire and a lot of the stuff starts to fall away there's still this very subtle sense of an i that is doing the inquiry yes as Muji put it so beautifully, as always, he said, he, he said, the one who starts the inquiry does not finish the inquiry, but is finished by the inquiry. And all the grammar students are going to love that. Oh, I love that. Yes. 
Oh, finished by the inquiry. Hmm. And it, that's actually possibly why there's more peace, a feeling of peace when you've done yes. a session of inquiry. I kind of just don't even, I don't have words after usually. I just want to be silent for like, can you imagine that? <laughs> Could you imagine? <laughs> you all have proof positive that this works. <laughs> it, it's a very beyond contempt, um, comfortable, needing, wanting nothing, but loving where you are. And I see now that, that how that, that statement comes in. Oh. Yes, and the and the whole construct of the egoic mind, uh, including that very subtle sense of self, right, is a construct. It's not who you are. Mm -hmm. And 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 this is the separating out of the of the sense of existence, your own sense of being, which is real, from all the ideas you have about what what that is, or rather who that is and those are all ideas those are all constructs those are all concepts in the mind that have been accumulated over a lot of time that created a sense of identity as as a, a, an energy as an organizing principle of the nervous system but it doesn't actually exist as an entity it's not really anyone any more than a, a robot is someone right so, yes, they will make robots at some point that are so lifelike, we won't be able to tell. Mm -hmm. And 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 how can you tell, right? How can you tell whether something is self-aware or not? You can't, right? You can only tell whether you are or not. And and this is a perfect uh, a perfect metaphor for the the nervous system and this, the egoic mind. It is a robotic functioning that appears as. A, a consistent whole, just like your, the body does, but there's not actually anybody there. The sense of self is projected on that, and that's where the identity comes from. You really do exist. You really are a self. You really are sentient and self-aware. And that gets projected on this whole structure and functioning of the, of the body-mind. And that's why we think we are that, and that when the message of enlightenment begins to get in, somehow we still think this is what's going to get enlightened. But this is what's really happening. That sense of I is returning back to the real, to the real you right, prior to the identification with the body-mind. Boy, whoever created this game, wow. <laughs> like, brilliant, isn't it? It's brilliant, and it's like, wow. It's There's... yeah. It's quite the journey. Yeah, we do need, we need a hundred years to go through all that, you know, each. <laughs> like, like, live a hundred years. Would be inside it. So, oh, I, you know what? That was so deep and fun. I know there's, ah, was that question? Um, it was about change. I was going back to the change. Oh, I know, I know, I know. So the organism of ourselves, this, this projected being safety and bringing it back to safety and change. If we, do not sense that we're in danger. We don't, is that, is it true that we don't have this inkling to change or will we naturally have an inclination to change, not just because of safety, but because we want to grow. But if we don't, if there's no nece necess necessity to grow or change, <laughs> do we need to? It's, it's, it's interesting. And a lot of people will say that, well, why would I be satisfied? I got, how can I be happy? Then I won't grow or, de or develop. And it becomes an interesting, it becomes an interesting dilemma. Uh, again, I, I just keep going back to, to the, the, the way things are, right? Okay. Right? <laughs> Not, I don't want to superimpose anything. You just kind of observe and, and watch. You know, the natural tendency of all organisms is to, is to get into a state, safe, stable state, and then stay there, and the adaptability of the organism is how well it can continue to do that, <clears throat> right? Now, within the when you're just looking at animal organisms and, and the like, there's no there's no there's no higher consciousness there. There's consciousness, of course. They're they're self aware, but there's no sense of being self aware. What's unique in the human being is that there is the self the, the awareness, and we're aware that we're aware. We have self. We have self-cognizance, right? 
And now when, when you look at the, the human being and its nature, right? Every other critter, when it gets to that place of stability, just kind of relaxes into it and is, and is only changing in response to the environment. But in the human being, something else happens. And, and it's very natural. And you see it in children and throughout all life. And, and that is, there's a creative impulse that happens. There's a need to, to create, to do, to dance, to sing, to make music and, 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 and art, to build stuff, to, to make tools. Now, it, if, if you really look at it, that's a completely natural phenomenon. Nobody made that happen, right? It's not just human beings when we talk about tools, crows do it and, you know, <clears throat> it's a thing that pops up in life, but it's in the extreme in, in, in human beings. You know, when you hear somebody like, I was just listening to a, a bunch of Bach and some analysis of Bach and some of the pieces that he did that <laughs> canons where the second part of the canon that yet he put it in as a riddle. You had to figure out that in order to do that, you took the original canon and you played it backwards and that gave, and he had all the lines. So it was another time you turned it upside down and then put them together. That's how, <laughs> I mean, when you look at the, the, the sheer level of creativity of that, you have to stand in awe the way I would a sunset or a quasar or something, right? You just kind of go, no, this is natural. You know, no, nobody made that. This isn't artif artificial, right? <clears throat> so there's something different about the human being, that this is part of the deal. This is like an explosion of creativity that takes place here. And if that's the case, then if the environment is going to produce happiness and safety, it's got to account for that. It's got to be an environment in which that is supported and encouraged, and that is made safe, because obviously it has to be safe to do that. Survival is one. So the uh, in general, just the, the survival of Earth doesn't really, well, it, it does to a certain degree provide for that. But what we need to do as human beings is we have to actually create because we can actually influence the environment. We have to make one that is that is um, consistent with our own nature. We haven't done that. We've done exactly the opposite. Yes, that's we want to we want to enslave everyone. We want everyone to conform. We don't want them to be them. To, to, to be themselves. So we're doing exactly the opposite with the environment, which is why everybody's unhappy. But you can't help but recognize that the nature of a human being is creative self-expression. You can't, I mean, it's obvious, it's natural. Yes, I, I love, oh my God, I can't wait to go back and listen to that. Um, I was listening intently and I love that you said you have to account for, so safety, uh, the environment for safety and, and making sure you're not in danger has to account for our experience of a creative change of, of the, of our creative impulses, our creative, like natural, unexpected, not planned, not inspired. Well, it can be inspired, but not like, okay, yeah. today I'm going to be creative, but on Friday I can't because I have this, but on Saturday I have time. So let's be creative. Yeah. It, yes. So the environment doesn't account for that impulsive. I love that, that um, creativity. It, it won't be safe. And then we will, desire and need a change yes and and, and now you'll have a, a, a conflict between human nature and the yeah. culture that we've created and that's exactly what we have right? yes oh, aren't these words good you guys conflict there you go see and so <laughs> when you're in conflict then you're not safe uh, um that is such that wraps it up so that's beautifully said i'm gonna so as everybody knows we're here on homeschool live so we're Put all your comments in and questions because now, just now, we're always around, you know, 40 minutes and we read through those comments and questions and get to have a bit more of an extended lesson on it. Um, but just before that, because you mentioned this earlier, GP, uh, I would love to invite everybody. You said something wonderful. In order to prepare for some, doing the self-inquiry work so you have um, stability and that you could be there and you could stay the witness and not jump into all these you know, erratic things that might leave you feeling really like, ah, right? The Yoga of Allowing is a beautiful course and it's an evergreen. So you, um, you can pop over to gpwalsh.com and it, on the website, go to the courses. No, no, it's not there. It's Unthinkific. I'm sorry. 
to think yes. of it. <laughs> yes. Um, we'll either get the link uh, and put it in the comments for you, but I just have to share with you that the prep work is so important because it, it you will feel safer <laughs> and more secure and not in so much danger and just have that stability in doing so. And you can start that at any time and listen to it as you would like to. It's not a live class or anything. You get that work done, the yoga of the allowing, and then you can step into that a little bit more, more comfortably, I'm going to say. And I like being comfortable. So, so that's the <laughs> yoga, yoga of allowing. I just had to, had to promote that. <laughs> so, yes. Oh, this is like, I feel like this is the foundational topic that we're, we're covering here right now and talking about and explain so much. And if, if this is helping you guys see anything and anything, you're like, ah, that's why, or Ooh, now I need to know why, or that's why another, please put the comments in here so we can, we can come back later and read them or, or now I'll just go through them right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we have hello from all these wonderful people. Ava's letting us know it's six o'clock. Jerry's and Ida. Temperature. Yes, you mentioned that. I can't remember. All right. And Mary's. Oh, uh, Pam Ferno. Oh, I haven't seen you for a little while. That's good. Something clicked with your discussion about thoughts of self. Thank you so much, GP and Lisa. And that could have been another one too, but I, is it this one about self? Self change? Pam, if you're still with us, if you want to give us a smidge more. Uh, I think what she's referring to, um, and yeah, please give us more of, uh, but I think what she's referring to is that there's, there's something that clicks just through the realization that, that most of what you've thought of uh, who you were, were just thoughts and not actually who you were, but we're so attached and we so, we so believe that we are that it literally forms our lives and our life behaves as if we were that person. That's why it's so, that's why it's so tricky. It's a little puzzle, right? Because, because the, the power of consciousness is to basically manifest that stuff. And by manifest, I don't mean the law of attraction and all that. I, I mean that when my perception is, is shaped like this, I will see everything through that lens. The world will appear to me and uh, as uh, in, con in conforming with that perception. That perception is formed by beliefs and the mother of all belief is our sense of identity. So, so that sense of self is getting constant feedback that it's true, right? But the problem is, is that it's, it's actually generating the feedback and we don't know it. It's creating the feedback, right? Which is why you can't look to the external circumstances for any kind of evidence or proof. And this is what's hard because we want to see results, right? Right. But the results aren't going to tell you anything. They're always a consequence, right? It's like trying to fix the mirror, um, you know, in order to lose weight, <laughs> right? It's not the mirror's problem. It's just reflecting back. You have to look at where it's coming from, which means we have to examine our beliefs and that realization that I have been thinking I was this way and just becoming skeptical, well, maybe I'm not that, right, is enough to start to break this thing open. And in fact, when I do sessions with people or in classes and the like, that's all forever what I'm doing. Well, what if it isn't true? I never even say it isn't true because if you do, the nervous system gets more defensive because it's, it's protecting that belief. So you just introduce the idea, whether you're tapping or not, what if it, is it possible that maybe it isn't? It probably is. Yep, it probably is the way it is. But, you know, could just be an assumption that we're so convinced of it, we kind of see it everywhere. It's an invitation, which is basically into the inquiry. Okay? That is the inquiry, but very gently. Right? Is it necessarily true? Is that really true? Right? I've believed it was true. I've experienced it is true, right? But is it, but is because I believe, am I experiencing it because I believe it? Or am I believing it because I'm experiencing it? Hmm, that's worth thinking about. Now you're very fully into the inquiry. You're, you're beginning to examine. And I think that's what she was saying. She, something clicked about, wait a minute, that's not actually who I am. Right? But now here's a key point. For anyone who gets to that, 
when you ask then the question, well, if I'm not that, then who am I? Don't take any answer. At that moment, your mind is going to try to come up with another story, a different version of you. Improved, hopefully, right? There's you no know, self-improvement and personal development and all that, but it will be just another story. It'll be just another staff that's going to become a snake, right? The, the mission is dismantle the story and don't create a new one and find out what's really there which doesn't require a story because <laughs> it's really there. <laughs> it doesn't require a concept. It doesn't require any kind of explanation because it's already there. And I love to, I, that's absolutely, uh, it's another note I just put, like, check everybody, check at 44 minutes and 40 seconds. <laughs> that's a big, a good tip. Um, and and just as we might do that self quote, say, it doesn't matter, a friend, a child, somebody they have, they're upset about something. They're afraid of something. It, it's not helpful when you say to them, "You're oh, you're not afraid of that. You're a big boy. You're or you're you're braver than that." <laughs> you're right because when you say no, you're not. Um, you say maybe you're not afraid. Well, what you know, you can inquire about it. But also to, and I just want to ask and say this at the same time. I believe that there's a bit of danger when other people say, "You oh no, you're not afraid of that," or it's just because of this. You can do it. Because if you drop your staff and turn snake, you might pick up somebody else's snake that they've their belief about you. Yeah, most of the time, all you're going to do is suppress the fear out of shame. Yes. Yeah. And now you're in a worse state than you were before. Now it's there, but you can't admit that it's there. Now it's harder to get to. <laughs> right. So I just this is how the layers get. This is how the layers get. You can, everybody can see their childhood right there. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. The entire, the, yes. I'm going to prove to them I can do it. You're like, you're like I, know I haven't done anything. I just because I don't want to be yes. <laughs> made fun of. <laughs> or I don't want to miss out on stuff. Like, okay, yeah, I can do that. But I don't want to miss out on this. But I really don't. This is, yes. Yeah. So I love that you said that. The tip is not to just go, okay, that's dropped. Then who am I? Oh. So yes, very, very yeah, good. Yeah, not just pick up something else. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. And how, hello, David and Elaine. Um, Werner, isn't a change in a deep-seated belief generally accompanied with a profound aha moment? <laughs> um, not always. Yes, the aha ones we remember, but sometimes, especially if you're engaged in self-inquiry, um, it can be it can be it can be just like a little notch at a time and suddenly you realize things are different um and it wasn't a great aha and nizagadati even made the point that oftentimes that's far more reliable long term than the than the great aha i've had plenty of people who practiced uh, allowing even going all the way back to when all i had was just allow it who said that one day suddenly something happened and they just didn't react there's no aha, there's nothing. It was just this gradual retraining. The, the thing about aha moments, they can come, right, at the moment where something breaks, right, and, you, and you're all of a sudden up-leveled, right? But oftentimes they become a peak experience. Then the old conditioning comes back in again, presses it down, and then we think we've lost something, and we can get on the hunt for aha moments. We can become addicted to the bliss. And it becomes peak experience after peak experience after peak experience, you know, one 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 mushroom trip after another, or one great <laughs> seminar after another, right? That, looking for that ex, that experience. Um, and and recognize that's not it. They can be informative, but they are almost never curative. They're never they're they're never transformative in and of themselves. It's the environment that receives them. And if that environment is is well prepared, a transformation can result because of that. Otherwise, it'll be an experience that your mind will chase. And GP shares his own story that you had a aha moment way back on the bridge when you were 17, and it was yeah. decades later of of practice. Decades of practice and going through it and and numerous, I mean revelations and oneness with god numerous and at the same time my life in totally in in the crapper <laughs> <laughs> can we change it, that it was just like <laughs> i just it was crazy it was just it was just crazy but 
event eventually I <laughs> eventually I came to terms with it. Right. But yes, it took dec it took decades for me. Yeah. Which is why I'm oh. trying to keep it from taking decades for you. <laughs> right. Yes. Thank you for the shortcut. We appreciate that. <laughs> and just uh, continuing our hellos. Oh, there you go, Bernadette. Yes, yeah, she is Switzerland often. No position for me. Thank you. <laughs> and Melissa, hello. And I can't pronounce that beautiful name. K H Quack. I'm going to go with. <laughs> and Quack. And uh, Blinky Boo. All right. I don't remember who related this, but it was said that said about India or the slums of India, you won't go there and speak of non-duality, but rather encourage self-efficiency. So she couldn't find her words, but the, she thinks it's the gist of what she wanted to say. Well, I think that's very, that's very true. Although Nizargadatta lived in the slums of Mumbai and people from all over the world came to see him. Um, he wasn't, he wasn't, you know, he, he wasn't a Brahmin. He didn't have the temples and all of that sort of stuff. He lived in his uh, an upper room in his son's house. And people came from all over the world to satsang with uh, with him, but it, this is always the case. I know I've heard of some non-dual teachers going to some some places, you know, like, you know, war torn or poor places, and talking about you know attitude and that sort of stuff. And it's completely inappropriate, right? Mm -hmm. you, you need to meet people where they are, right? It's why I'm all for uh, I'm I'm all for making self-sufficient communities. I'm still very critical of the of those of those three old teenagers who wanted to take a space ride when they could have actually repaired the lives of literally millions of people and made them self-sufficient for for generations. Um, I mean, it's 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 tragic because we need to think in those terms. Um, it, when the door is open to take somebody into a deeper inquiry. You have to read the environment, right? <laughs> you know, you know. If somebody's starving, you don't talk to them about the unreality of hunger. You give them food, right? <laughs> I, I mean, it, you, you just look at it at the most primitive levels, right? People, in order for people to engage in these things, except for there are rare people that that don't. We, you need to, you need to try to make their basic needs met so they feel for the so they feel safe. But also, we we don't also in places like India and and the like, you know, the happiest countries in the world are not the wealthiest countries. Yeah. Period. Right. And, and so we have to have to realize that the wealthiest countries are very unhappy because there's there's this constant upping of the expectations, which are unattainable. Right. Where you go to other places that don't have that, they give you the shirt off their back, and they're happy as they can be. You're you're one of them. They welcome they welcome you in, um, and, and so so we have to don't impose our ideas of poverty in, on them, and think they they must not be happy because they don't have money. No, you're not happy because you don't have money. Not them. They're fine. They got each other. They got family. They got stuff. They got what they need. They're fine, right? So you, you, we, we we're we're forever um, looking at other cultures through these very very colored lenses. And it, it's it's it, it's very destructive because every, because now you get people in the West thinking everybody wants to live like we do. No, they don't. <laughs> I don't even want to live like them. People <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. So um, so it, it, it's this is an this is an art, you know, knowing what to say to whom, when, and how to say it, and that brings about the 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 most good that can be brought about in that moment yeah and i think when blinky just followed up with this um i just used india but could have easily said any other country which i think you included as you were doing that and and yeah. that's something that, that i yes i that i'm making light of this a little bit but the same thing i look at big houses and think i would never want to wash those windows or those floors or like that looks like hell to me I, there was not, a time when i thought oh that's great with the big house and now i go Oh my God! Who's going to dust that? Exactly. <laughs> and it kind of goes. My, I've got a little. I've got a little one bedroom apartment. I'm going. Oh God! I have to clean it again. <laughs> <laughs> and same with jobs or money. Like you just have to balance more expense. And not to say that that isn't wonderful. Maybe you love doing that. You you know. So yes, I think that was well was well said. And we we can't. Ju we're judging with a lens of what we think others are going through. Well, that's the whole thing, isn't it? Yeah. 
And that yeah. lens is created by who you think you are. Yes. And I do want to get to Melissa. She may have just been making a comment, but I do think there's a little bit of a, a question here. Um, when you observe people lashing out from ego, because, you know, um, tools are ways to remain at peace and not get triggered. And I think we, uh, a little bit, but when, yeah. when we are the observer and we're not taking that position of well, no, we talked about triggers. I said, what if somebody is like peer pressuring you or, or judging you into in one of their beliefs? Like, don't be like this, be like this. Or you respond and go, no, I don't want to be like that. Yeah. In the moment, in any given moment, you're going to respond according to the, the, the way you have been conditioned to respond or to the, to the way that you have inquired and trained yourself to see it differently. The only way, the, the best tool for dealing with people who are triggering you is to not be triggerable. <laughs> and that's what this practice is all about. That's what self-inquiry brings you to. Because you, you, be, you disidentify with all of the conditioned patterns. Remember, the, the ego is nothing but the sum total of all the conditioning that you've identified with. So if the identification is gone, the conditioning can't sustain itself. It is sustained by the sense of identity. When the sense of identity has been removed from it, the conditioning begins to dissipate and the nervous system starts to respond according to the nature of your true self. It literally becomes the reflection of the divine. That's what the sage is. It is somebody who is not a person anymore. It is literally God present, appearing as a person. And so to just kind of take it a couple of steps back, it's just the process of disidentification. When that happens, even if the trigger still happens, because you're not identified with it, you just notice it as an energy rippling through your body and it doesn't cascade, right? The reaction is there as if it was going to go into a particular response, which is the way it's programmed to do. But because, because the disidentification is concerned, that response doesn't happen. You may still feel it in the body. They may feel kind of the sting, but the reaction won't be there. And eventually you won't even feel it. There'll be, though, because there won't be anything there to vibrate, right? If there's no trigger, it doesn't matter how, if there's no button, it doesn't matter how many times they push, there's no button. And so this is the whole process of disassociation, disassociating, disconnecting with it. And disidentification, because that was like and, a perfect yes. You've been misidentified. Everything. Yes. yes. I have identified myself as the conditioning, and now I'm trying to figure out how to make the conditioning better, right? Yes. It's, 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 it's the same thing. I've, I think I'm a robot, and now I just want to program the robot better. You're not a robot. <laughs> Yes, that is you're not the there. robot. And we've mistaken the conditioning, which is nothing but an organic robot for ourselves. All starting with that very first belief, I am the body. <sighs> yes, and we got that word in there. Disidentification. I was saying misidentification, misidentified. <laughs> <laughs> that's we've played oh that was so beautiful i love that and and it looks like some other people verner and i want to apologize for saying Werner earlier so verner yes love the sessions leaving me bursting or busting with thoughts and experiences <laughs> me too <laughs> and that, so okay so we, we've gone through a lot i want to have a nice little wrap up with a bow here um because right now I, like my all my conditioning itself is like all right what do i do next <laughs> like this, like this. Uh, so thank you, Winky. Because you really, that's what happened. So I know for myself, because the, you, we've picked a time, this is the hour we're here. And we, but do we just do the observer? Do we just now say, all right, let's just see what shows up? Yeah, well, it's a practice. That's why I designed Yoga of Allowing and uh, Just Allowed and those kinds of, uh, kind of, uh, kind of things because it's habitual. As Quack just point out, the problem is reacting quickly enough to triggers before you go into ego, right? And that's actually the case. But there's no way you the, the, the training for that is not getting better at spotting it. The 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 training is disidentification. It is to is to learn in a very practical way 
how to simply allow feelings to be there. The more we can do that, the, the better we are at it. You know, it's like, you know, when you start lifting weights, you start with 10 pounds or five or less, right? But eventually you get, you get heavier and heavier weights. It, it, the heavier and heavier stuff can come up without reaction. So you're not learning how to not follow the ego to the trigger. You're, you're literally disabling the trigger. You see the whole mechanism. And at first you will. As the disidentification begins, something will happen in the environment. You'll feel the nervous system respond to it. And then you'll watch it attempt to get into the actions that that, that, that particular program has set up. And before that, any awareness is brought, any kind of awakening is brought to bear, it happens so reflexively that we don't know that it is actually a process that can be intervened. <laughs> we don't know it because it's just happening. So some degree of awakening takes place. You recognize that it is. And at first, you still can't do anything about it, right? <laughs> it's just going to happen. But the more you practice it, and the practice starts with simply, we don't want to start by, you know, with the big stuff, right? We want to start with the stuff that it's, it's manageable. How about your own feelings about yourself, right? Just think of something that you don't like about yourself and watch what happens, right? Think of, remember something somebody said to you and watch what happens. But then instead of, you, you'll, you'll notice right in that time, the reaction will take place and... All the justification, or right, or it'll be either why did they say that, that jerk, or oh god, I always do that, I'm so stupid. And, and you'll watch all of that is the programmed response, all of it, right? And you know it because you're watching it. <laughs> if it was you, you wouldn't be able to see it. So, so this is where it starts. It goes, oh, there it is. And you can start by just remembering stuff. In just remembering something that, that, that has taken place because the, the, the thought of it alone will trigger it. And that's good. I call it an intentional triggering because you're safe. Nobody's really there doing it, right? But the feelings will be there. The reactions will be there. And that's how you learn, the, see how the entire mechanism works. And once you see how it works, now you, then, then mastery isn't far behind that. But you have to see the entire thing, how it plays out. And now, then you, you can't be fooled anymore. Right? But it takes some time because it is reflex. You'll find yourself, you know, you'll find yourself 10 steps down the line <laughs> and go, how, how did I get here? But the moment you know it, you go, thank God, I saw it. And you bring yourself back. The next time you'll only get eight steps down the line, right? <laughs> you know, and eventually you won't go down the line at all. And then eventually even the, the feelings in the body that triggered the reactions will begin to dissipate until it doesn't matter what anybody says, nothing bothers you. Yes. And that is, I, I love that you, you give us a little hope there too. <laughs> you know, while, whilst you're going there, you will still go the 10 steps down the line, but then it will get less and, and less. And sometimes you may yeah. still stick with one step for like 20 years. It's and There's no judgment on that. Yes. Yes. So. Yeah, you can't lay anything on top of it because that's all part of the same mechanism to make you, to turn you into a person that's got a struggle. It's all part, remember, it all comes from one thought. I am the body. It all came from there. The root. Okay. <laughs> that's the root. Everything has its has its has its roots there. Right. And, and so what we're little by little is working our way back to that. Right. Going back the way we came to that very first belief. Right. And and with the belief that I am the body came the fear of death and the fear of lack. Yes. Yeah, and there's our safety in our environment again. Oh my gosh, see, this this is such a good, We yeah, we knew this one, this was gonna be a good class, but I don't wanna leave without just um, seeing what uh, Lava Light. Lava because, Light, isn't that a great name? Lava Light, I love that. <laughs> I, love, I love a Lava Light. Guys, <laughs> um, six months ago, consciousness, awareness, started doing me. Sadhana doing me. I saw I wasn't doer, seeker. Now I know it's not up to me, help. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Melissa. Um, so at 70, lava light, it matters. So yeah, let's we'll wrap up with that one. Thank you, everybody. Okay. 
Um, yes, it uh, it matters at 70, at 90, at 104, at, uh, at 40. Um, you're, you've become now aware uh, on what appears to be a, a deep level, because it's been persistent now for six months, that you're not the doer, the seeker. There's something else going on. That sadhana, sadhana, which is spiritual practice, that's the Sanskrit word for spiritual practice, is 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 simply happening, right? But notice, there's there's still a sense of an I there, right? So step back into the position of witnessing the sadhana, right? That it isn't doing you. There's no you there to be done. There's only it. And it is expressing itself. There's only awareness and awareness aware of itself. So there's not even a me that's doing it, right? Like if there's not a GP that the words come through, right? There's only the words. GP doesn't exist. That's a concept you've projected on this particular body mind that thinks, oh, he's this and he knows this and it's coming through him. There's no him through which it's coming, right? There's nobody there, like, like a robot. There's nobody there. It's just all coming from, from where? From the true self. So it's not up to you. So now let go of the you that you don't think it's up to. You can see how subtle it is that the, that the egoic mind, that the storyteller creates yet another identity, right? So notice, even your witnessing is being witnessed. Right? So step back even from that to, the, to that which is simply aware, right? To the awareness itself which is what you actually are. That's the God self. That's the absolute. And that is what you, that is what you truly are. And that's not 70 years old. <laughs> <laughs> it's timeless. Is there? I, I I think this one this one could be a set song. To be honest, it would be lovely. <laughs> and so, do we we should say goodbye? I see that Bernadette said something, but if we can answer that in one minute or less, can we do that? And then, we'll, then it really um, will up. Well, no. We, we I, I, our our show next week we've already decided is going to be on soul disconnect. That's now, when funny. we when we when we disassemble our reflective thoughts, all of our relationships become authentic instead of conditioning. We're not reacting anymore. We're really there. Uh, until that happens, there's actually no intimacy oh, because yes. it's always the presentation of the person, and it's never really you. That's why it's not satisfying. So, in fact, the relationships become deeper. They become genuine, right? Yes, and safe. So Bernadette, <laughs> next week. <laughs> Thank you, right. everyone. Thank you so much. And this is, this is Thanks, uh, I'll talk to you next week. Bye.